So we're going to turn to the Gospel of Luke. We're making our way through the Gospel of Luke. We're in the 8th chapter. What a wonderful study this is, making our way through verse by verse, all the way through this Gospel. If, if this has been a blessing to you, would you say amen? amen? And here's a question for you Bible students. We, we plan to move on today and cover more ground here. But here's a question for you Bible students. Who was the first person that Jesus sent out to be a missionary? Who was the first person Jesus sent out during His ministry to be a missionary? We might think it was uh, one, of his 12, one of His many, many disciples. Or we might think it was uh, one of His twelve apostles. Maybe one of the 70 that he sent out. We might uh, think that it was one of the highly educated religious leaders trained in the seminaries around Jerusalem. There were 30 seminaries in Jerusalem where they trained people in the Word of God, and the meaning and, and giving the sense of the Word of God. There were a lot of people that could have been great to go out and share his word. Who was the first missionary? that Jesus sent out. And, and, and surprisingly, if we guessed any of those, we would be wrong. The first missionary Jesus sent out did not come from a seminary. The first missionary Jesus sent out actually came from a cemetery. And we're going to learn about him today. He was a man who lived in the tombs. We're going to learn about him in our text this morning. So we're going to learn what Jesus did for him. So the first thing we're going to notice, we, we, we begin in Luke chapter 8, beginning in verse number 26. And the first thing we're going to notice here is the purpose of Christ's destination. The, the reason Jesus was going, decided to go where he decided to go. So uh, let's look at verse 26. It says, Then they sailed to the country of the Gadarenes, which is opposite Galilee. They sailed to the country of the Gadarenes. Now look at that word Gadarenes. And if you would just underline the, the first three letters of the word Gadarenes. Underline the part where it says Gad. Gad. They went to the country of the Gadarenes, which is opposite Galilee. So if you'll remember last time as, as we went through our text and came to this point, we saw Jesus up north of the Sea of Galilee in the land of Capernaum. And he had been ministering to a very, very large crowd. And there were so many people. You know, he was teaching them. And he was healing their sicknesses. He was casting out demons. He was, he was pouring his heart into to, to so many people. And there was such a big crowd that even when his family came out, you know, to, to try to talk a little sense into Jesus, can you, if you can imagine that, you know, Jesus knows more than all of us. But even when his mother and his brothers came out to, to try to talk to him, they couldn't get to him because of the crowd that was there to hear his, his message. But then we saw... Uh, in verse 22, that Jesus told his disciples to get into a boat. Come on, guys, let's get into a boat. And to cross over, he said, we're going to cross over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. That, that big lake that they call the Sea of Galilee, about 15 miles distance across to the other side where they were going. Now, we talked last time about some of the reasons why... Jesus made this decision to cross over to the other side. I believe there are three reasons, and we talked about a couple of them last week. The first reason, I believe Jesus just simply needed a little bit of rest. Sometimes you need just a little bit of rest. And this is a, a very important thing. It's very important to what we understand about Jesus. Because, see, He's God, right? Amen? Amen. He's Jesus. He's God. He's the Son of God. He's God the Son. Yet when He came down to dwell among us, He, he came 
in a human body. He dwelt among us in a human flesh body. And so he got tired, right? He got tired and he was so busy just pouring himself into this crowd that he got tired. He needed some rest. He needed to put some distance between him and the crowd. And we've, we've seen that before, that needing to put a little distance between him and his disciples in the crowd, he, sometimes he would get into a boat. One time he did that even just so he could preach to them from on the boat while the crowd was out there on the shore. And, and now we see him going clear over to the other side. I believe he needed a little rest. We see we saw that in the story last time that as they got out on the water, they're sailing across over the other side. Jesus laid down, put his head on a pillow there in the boat and started taking a sweet little nap. Amen. Isn't that great? This is amazing because God in a human body got tired. He got tired. And he needed a little bit of rest. The second reason I believe Jesus went across this sea, and we kind of alluded to it last week, is that he wanted to teach his disciples a lesson. They were in a very much of a learning process. When they became his apostles, they, they began following him. They still had a lot to learn, and he was teaching them as they went. And they needed to learn a lesson in how to trust him. Amen? And so Jesus takes them out there. God bless both of y'all for those two amens I got. Okay. He's, he, as they're going across there, Jesus is sleeping in the boat. And what, what happened? The storm came out, right? And, and as the winds were getting high, as the waves were raging higher, and the boat was filling with water, the Bible says they were in jeopardy. And so naturally they were afraid. They did better than I would have, by the way. I'd have been afraid long before they were. I'd have wimped out and woke Jesus up from his sweet little nap he was taking. But they woke Jesus up. They said, Master, Master, we are perishing. They came to him and woke him. And then he arose and he rebuked the wind and the raging of the water. And what happened to the, the wind and the raging of the water? They ceased, right? Like obedient little children. They obeyed the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ. They ceased and there was a calm. Amen? Isn't that power? That is powerful but he said to them, he said to his disciples, where is your faith? And they were afraid and they marveled, saying to one another, who can this be? For he commands even the winds and the water and they obey him. So even when Jesus is taking a nap, you know, he's still busy, still bringing his disciples through storms to build up their character and teach them how to trust him more. Always doing something. And, and these are amazing things Luke has shown us here uh, because Jesus was fully God, but He's fully man at the same time. And so He's so much man that He slept in this boat, but He's so much God that the storm ceased as soon as He spoke. It's powerful what we see there. But the third reason Jesus got in this boat, He made this decision to cross over to the other side is because there was a very desperate man over there on the other side. A hurting man who's very much in need of a touch from the healing hand of Jesus. Jesus was not just trying to get away from a bunch of people who needed him, but he was sailing towards another person who needed him very desperately. And Jesus is going to help him. That's, I think, the three reasons why Jesus made this decision to get in the bell, into the boat and sail across to the other side. But now, as Jesus is sailing over there to help this man, here's the thing we need to understand. This gang is headed into a very dangerous territory, a very dangerous situation in a very dangerous territory. He's going to the land of the Gadarenes, right? We, we already zeroed in on that name of that place, Gadarenes, or it's a place called Gadara. And there's a reason the Bible calls it the other side. I mean, other than the fact that it's on the other side of the lake. This is really the other side away from Galilee, away from Israel, Canaan proper. You may remember the... 
the story of Numbers 32, when the children of Israel were making their way to the Jordan River, and getting ready to cross over into the land of Canaan, which the Lord had promised them. You may, may remember the story that as they got there near the Jordan River, there was the tribe of Gad and the tribe of Reuben who said to Moses, hey, we would like to live here on the east side of Jordan instead of going over in, on the west side into the land of Canaan. We'd like to live here because this will be good land to uh, raise our livestock. We want to stay over here, not the land which God said He's going to bring us to. We want to stay here. And so Moses reminded them, hey, we still have battles to fight. We still have enemies to face on the battlefield. And so the people of the tribes of Gad and the tribe of Reuben uh, spoke with Moses and they made a commitment to him. They said, we're not going to stay away from the fight. We're going to go over there with you and we will help you in the fight. We will fight until all the inhabitants of Canaan are defeated and have departed out of the land. And then when the battles are over, then we will come back. We'll leave our, our women and our children here. We'll go fight with you. And then we'll come back and we'll raise our livestock here on the east side of the Jordan. And so Moses said, okay, but you're going to come and fight with us. You're going to, you, you, you got to keep your word. If you fight with us, then it'll be okay for you to go. But what we see now is this land. And this is how this land became known as Gadara because the tribe of Gad, who, the people who first began to settle there. But what we have to understand from this is that these are a group of people who have rejected what God's will was for them. And they've said, we want what we want for ourselves instead of what God wants for us. You understand what I'm saying? God says, I want to give you the land of Canaan. They said, we want this over here instead. And so God allowed them, but it's never wise to desire for yourself what you want and choose for yourself what you want rather than what God wants you for, for you. Because what God wants for you is always better than what you want for yourself. And so they made this choice. And what we see from this, this is the other side now. It became a terrible place. It's overrun with pigs which are unclean to the Israelites. It's overrun with tombs. It is overrun with demonic activity, as we're going to see in our text this morning. We see what became of the land of Gadara. And so the, is the, the, the disciples of Jesus, Jesus and His apostles, they are heading now into a land of a group of people who have rejected God's will for themselves. They have chosen their own way. And it is a land that has hurt the more because of it. We're never wise to do that. And it is in this place where Jesus is going to meet this very desperate, hurting individual. And so that brings us to our second point this morning. We're going to see the person and his desperation. That's number two on your outline. The person and his desperation. Verse number 27 says, When Jesus stepped out on the land. They've made their way to the other side. He stepped out on the land. As soon as he did, there met him a certain man from the city who had demons for a long time. Now, here's the ugly reality of demon possession. We see it here in the Scripture. Paul tells us in the book of Ephesians chapter 6, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Hosts are armies, spiritual armies of wickedness in heavenly places. He says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Paul makes it clear to us there that Satan has a large army, spiritual hosts of wickedness, wicked spirits, demon spirits. He calls them here spiritual hosts. And we need to put on the spiritual armor of God, the whole armor of God, 
in order to be protected from those wicked forces. Now, there's no indication in the Bible. I do not believe that a born-again Christian, I do not believe it's possible for a demon to possess a born-again Christian in whom the Holy Spirit of God dwells. Okay? Now, demonic spirits may be able to oppress us. They may be able to vex us and trouble us and torment us. But I do not believe they can possess us like they possessed this poor man here. Paul tells us that he was buffeted. He was troubled. He was buffeted by a messenger from Satan. And some believe that that was a demon spirit who was bothering. Some other pastors believe maybe it was a disgruntled church member. I don't know. Uh, but uh, a messenger from Satan that kept troubling him. Uh, and we can be oppressed. But I do not believe that a Christian can be possessed by a demonic spirit. And I think I, I, I defer to what Jesus said. And he spoke of how when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places, but he comes back and he, 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 he finds the house swept and empty, right? That man has cleaned his life up, right? And he comes back, he finds that person, the house is swept and clean and empty, so he brings seven other spirits with him, and the last state of that man is worse than the first, okay? And so here's a person who... When the, here's the key, I think, is when the person comes back, when the, the demon spirit comes back, they find the house empty. In other words, the Holy Spirit is not dwelling within that person. If they find the house empty, the, the Lord Jesus is not living in the heart of that person. And so they find the house empty, the demons can come in. But if the house is filled, right? If we're filled with the Lord Jesus, if the Lord Jesus is living within us, if the Holy Spirit dwells within us, I don't believe the demon can come and inhabit a person who has. Matthew 12, by the way, is where uh, Jesus said that. So in light of that, I think the key is, is being filled with the Holy Spirit. So, this poor man, though, he was possessed by a demon. And he really didn't have any, any uh, defense against it because he lived in a culture who had rejected God's way. They had rejected. They said, we, we want our own will for ourselves. And so they didn't go after God's will for themselves. And, and m many people doubt that such a thing is real. Demon possession. Even many Christians don't want to believe demon possession exists. They want to dismiss it or try to minimize it or define it as something else. But demon possession is very real. Real. We see it right here in the scripture. And in the culture of Gadara, where men rejected the will of God for themselves, demonic activity, it was rampant, and they had no armor. They were defenseless against the attack of Satan's hosts. And so here's a man who'd been possessed with demons, the scripture tells us, for a long time, because this was a culture that rejected the will of God. Nobody knew how to help him. You understand? It's a desperate man. And so verse 27 tells us. Verse 27 says, He wore no clothes. Nakedness. Pornography. Indecency. All signs of demonic influence and demonic activity. Pornography. You're, when, you, when you mess with that stuff, you're playing into the hands of the devil. And when you mess with that stuff, you know, it's kind of like a drug. You get a little high from it. You get a thrill from it. And then you can never, you're always chasing that high again. And so you don't fulfill it the next time. So you go to something worse. You go to something darker. You go to something deeper. And it gets worse and worse and worse. And before you know it, it's, it's, it's overtaking your life with such disgusting, horrible things. If you're messing with that stuff at all, you need to turn away from it. You're playing right into the hands of demonic influence. 
Last Sunday we mentioned the fact that when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, they knew they were naked. They were ashamed. They're hiding from the Lord's presence. We don't try to be near the Lord when we're ashamed because of our sin. But it was wonderful. It's beautiful. The Lord, in His mercy, made coats of skins for them. He had compassion on them. He covered the shame of their nakedness. But demonic evil influences people to cast off their clothes and, and to look at pornography. And, and, it, and it numbs us. It desensitizes us to any shame we might feel. The Old Testament book of Jeremiah, it speaks about a, a harlot's forehead. You know what a harlot's forehead is? A harlot's forehead never blushes because they've desensitized themselves to the sin they engage in. They, they're not ashamed of anything anymore. And there's things we do we ought to be ashamed of. But demonic influence just keeps hitting at us with this sinful stuff and it desensitizes us let me spit the words out. <laughs> Desensitizes us to any shame we might feel. And you know, you guys, just as well as I know, you know this, that our culture is filled with that kind of demonic activity. Everywhere you look is filth and nakedness. People not wearing enough clothes. Put some clothes on, for goodness sake. Be modest. And this guy wore no clothes. He was influenced by a demon. Secondly, Verse 27, nor did he live in a house, but in the tombs. And that's one of the goals of, of demonic activity, to move men as far as possible away from anything that resembles life. Satan wants to destroy us, and so he drags men toward the grave because he wants us to get used to death. That's where he wants us. As we said last time, you know, it's like when you're standing by the pool and your buddies come up behind you, you know. And you see them kind of grinning and smiling, so you know you're going in, right? And so you grab them and you take as many of them in with you as you can take with you, right? When they're going to push you in, right? And that's what Satan's trying to do. He's trying to pull as many people into hell as he can. He wants to kill as many people. He knows where he's headed. And this man is literally living in the tombs. He's so used to death in a, in a cemetery where dead bodies were buried. And you know, just as well as I do, folks, you know that our culture, our modern entertainment is obsessed with death. Ghostbusters and, and uh, Tomb Raiders and, and every, everywhere you look, there's just demonic influence in everything that we look at entertainment-wise. All kinds of things. Communicating with the dead. So as soon as Jesus steps out of the boat onto the land, here comes this rude, crude dude in the nude. Demon-possessed man running to meet Jesus. And verse 28 says, When he saw Jesus, he cried out. And I bet that the disciples are turning around, heading back to the boat. Let's go back into the storm, Lord, you know. Let's get back in the water. This guy's screaming out, he's, he's crying out, but watch this. He fell down before Jesus. And with a loud voice, he said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Do you think you have great faith because you know who Jesus is? Because you believe in who He is? James tells us that's no big deal. James chapter 2, he says, because even the demons believe and they tremble before Jesus. Our faith had better be much more than just believing some facts about Jesus. The demon within this man knew who Jesus was. And he went on to say, to plead with Jesus. He pled with Jesus. He said, I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of him. You better believe the demons know who Jesus is. And they, they tremble before him. Now, there's, like we said, I don't want you to get worried if you're a Christian that you could be possessed by a demon if you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Let me say that again. But you can be influenced. And you don't want to let that happen. The third thing we see now is... The power of the demons. Because these are fallen angelic creatures. 
rebelled, left their first estate. And we see they're powerful. Verse 29 goes on, it says, For it had often seized him, this demon had often seized the man, and he was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles. Now you see here, this shows us how unbelieving men try to deal with demonic activity. Real evil inspired by demonic activity. How do unbelieving men try to handle it? They try to incarcerate it. Try to lock it up with chains. They try to bind it with chains. They also sometimes in our day try to medicate it. People who do evil things. People who kill and kill and kill. Violent criminals. They try to incarcerate. They try to medicate. Yet incarceration and medication will never have the power to work against such demonic power. And we know that because they chained this man up. And they tried to keep him bound in a tomb. But Luke tells us in verse 29, he broke the bonds, he broke the chains, and he was driven by the demon into the wilderness. Man's power can't fix this. Man's power can't fix this. But we know whose power can, amen? So verse 4, I mean, excuse me, not verse 4, verse 30. Number 4, point number 4, the power of the divine. The power of the divine. We see the power of the one who can fix this. Jesus, the God who can. And so verse 30, Jesus asked him saying, what is your name? And he said, Legion, because many demons had entered him. In a Roman legion, there were 6,000 soldiers. That doesn't necessarily mean that there were 6,000 demons possessing this man. We really don't know how many demons were in him because the Bible doesn't tell us that. But what we do know is that many demons had entered into him because the Bible does tell us that. Many demons had entered him. And so he says, Legion, for, and one of the other gospel writers says, For we are many. But the other thing we know is that no matter how many demons were in this man, whether it was six or whether it was 600 or whether it was six million, Jesus is more powerful than all of them. Where Luke tells us in verse 31, they begged him. You see how the demons within this man have control this man to, to fall down before Jesus, to cry out to him, do not torment me. And he said they begged him that he would not command them to go out into the abyss. He said, what's the abyss? From what we read about the abyss in the Bible, abyss from the Greek word abuso seems to be a pit that leads down into the heart of the earth where Many demon spirits are held captive until the last days. In the book of Revelation, the abyss is also called the bottomless pit. You see the words, the bottomless pit, same Greek word, abuso. In Revelation 9, that, that pit is opened up and smoke comes out and locusts ascend out of that pit that have the power to torment men with the sting of a scorpion for the space of five months. I'm sure you've read that. Comes out of the bottomless pit, the abuso. In Revelation 9, yeah, it's, that is. And then in Revelation 11, the beast will ascend out of that, that bottomless pit. He will make war against the two prophets of the Lord that are testifying in those days. And... In Revelation 20, Satan himself will be bound with a chain and he will be imprisoned in that pit for a thousand years. So understand what, what, what we understand here is that men were not powerful enough to bind the demons that dwelled in this poor man. But those demons knew very well that the Lord Jesus is more powerful than any of them. He's powerful enough to bind them and keep them bound in the abyss. And they don't want to go there. 
They knew what Jesus could do. And so they begged him not to cast him into the abyss. And so, verse 32 says, A herd of swine, many swine. Another gospel writer tells us about 2,000 swine. A herd of many swine was feeding there on the mountain. Pigs, which were unclean to the Jewish people. But the, evidently the men of Gadara had made a practice of raising them. So pigs everywhere. And so the demons begged him that he would permit them to enter the swine. Don't send us to the abyss. Let us enter the swine. And Jesus permitted them. It wasn't their time yet to go to the abyss. You know, and, and, and Mark tells us they, that they said they begged Jesus, don't torment us before the time. It wasn't their time yet. And so Jesus permitted them to enter the swine. And so verse 33 tells us, Then the demons went out of the man and entered the swine. And so here's the first time we see deviled ham in the Bible. The demons entered the swine. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the lake and drowned. The entire group of pigs all went down and committed suicide in the lake down there below. Suicide. And so we, we've seen the power of the demons. They could break the chains. They had more power than, than normal men. But we see the power of the divine. Our Lord Jesus is stronger. Amen? Fifthly, we see the petition for His departure. The people there literally want Jesus to leave. We see this in verse 34, when those who fed the swine uh, saw what happened. And you might want to just underline that where it says those who fed them, the people who fed those swine. When they saw what happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Then they went out, the people who were told, they went out to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus and they found the man from whom the demons had departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. Sounds very similar to the story we've already seen about the woman who anointed Jesus' feet with the precious ointment. She is sitting at Jesus' feet, weeping, washing his feet with her tears. This man is sitting at Jesus' feet clothed and in his right mind. They also who had seen it told them by what means he who had been demon-possessed was healed. In other words, the, the demons went out of him, went into the pigs, the pigs committed suicide. And so this is a wonderful thing. A man who had been tormented by many demons for a long time had been delivered. And don't forget, he finally put some clothes on. Praise God for that. Amen? Isn't that great? And he was in his right mind. Listen. This, this, is, this is something, these folks, you know, these people who witness these things, they should have been amazed. Amen? They should, they should have rejoiced at all, everything Jesus did. But notice what the Word of God tells us about how they reacted to everything they'd seen here. Verse 35, they were, what? Afraid. They didn't rejoice. They weren't happy that a man was healed. They were afraid. Now, what do you think they were afraid of? Were they afraid of a man who, who delivers people from demons? And, and were they afraid of a man who heals people and gives them the right mind back? Well, that's a gentle, merciful, loving Savior. They weren't, they, of course not. They're not afraid of that. But it's not hard to see what they're afraid of. And it, it goes back to what we saw there in verse 34, which it tells us that these were the men who fed the swine. And, and what we see that they did, verse 37, because they were the people that fed the swine, says, Then the whole multitude of the surrounding region of the Gadarenes asked Jesus to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. You see, they didn't care at all about the soul of a man who was tortured by demons. They didn't care at all about that. You know what they did care about? their bottom line. They cared more about their profit than they cared about that person. How much money did they lose when those pigs ran down that hill? 
How much more will it cost him if Jesus is to stay? I look at these men, and I think they're like the Hugh Hefners of their day. People who don't care how many lives they ruin as long as they're making some money. The drug pushers who don't care how many people die from fentanyl. The human traffickers who don't care how many lives they ruin. Either the parents they destroy or the children they destroy. As long as they're raking in some cash, it's all they care about. They don't want Jesus around, even though He saves lives, even though He rescues soul from, souls from hell, they want Him to leave because He cuts into their money. So they begged Him to leave. And so you know what He did? He left. Verse 37, He got into the boat and He returned. And that's the thing, if you reject Jesus, you don't want Him in your life, He won't force you to let him stay. Right? He wants you to want him. But if you don't want him, he won't force you. And that's a tragic choice they made. So tragic. Finally, number six, the promotion of his declarer. I told you Jesus was going to send out a missionary here, right? Look at verse 38. Now the man from whom the demon had departed begged Jesus that he might be with him. The pig farmers didn't want Jesus around, right? But this man sure did. Jesus gave him his life back, right? And he, he, he was ready to follow Jesus anywhere. I'll go with you wherever you, you go. He's ready to follow Jesus anywhere. But, verse 38 goes on to tell us, Jesus sent him away. Jesus sent him away. Now that might sound strange. It might sound a little disappointing. You might want to have wanted Jesus to say, okay, come on, follow us. Come on, guy. We've got lots of things for you to do. But it's only disappointing until we learn the reason why. In verse 38, Jesus sent him away, saying, return to your own house, and tell what great things God has done for you. So Jesus wouldn't allow him to follow him, but only because he needed him to stay there in Gadara and spread the word about him. To tell the people all about what God had done for him. The people didn't want Jesus there, but this man was already there. And so Jesus is sending him, the first missionary he ever sent out, not just out of the seminary, but just out of the cemetery, the first missionary went out and told people about Jesus. And oh, what a story he had to tell. Amen. Jesus delivered him from demons. In verse number 39, he went his way and proclaimed throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done. Did you catch that little detail here in verse 39? There, there's an important kind of little detail that you, if you're not careful, you miss it. Jesus told him, go and tell the people what God has done for you, right? See that word? The man went and proclaimed what great, great things who? Jesus had done for him. And that's totally great because Jesus is God, right? He didn't, this guy got it. Jesus is God. He's the God who calms the storm. We saw last time. He's the God who commands the demons to leave and they leave like we saw this time.